going on everyone my name is Andy welcome back to another FPL video and today I'm going to talk about potential players to avoid this is a video I did in actual pre-season before this whole season started and I thought I'd do it again for kind of project restart obviously we know now there's only a few weeks left we know how players have performed whether they should still be owned whether they've maybe lost their place what the potential fixtures are as well that they've got not only just coming up now in the next few weeks but also over the long term until the end of the season as well so there's going to be some controversy on this list i would say it's not necessarily you absolutely must avoid all these players but there's some good reasons why you should probably think about either taking them out of your team or not buying them if you don't already own them so i'm going to go through five players in this list usual caveat supply the FPL game is not quite open yet, but we're going to assume that there's only going to be nine game weeks left with one double game week at the start. Uh, and again, the fixtures at the time of recording are not confirmed yet, but given the few leaks and stuff that have come out, it looks pretty much like they're going to go with the same fixture order as what was uh, going to be played anyway if the season had continued outside of the double game week. But we know that's coming in the opening game week as well. So I've got all the fixtures down on the players. Let's get into it. So let's start off with probably one of the players, one of the top two, I'd say, on this list that might cause some controversy let me know in the comments below when you've watched the whole video which of the five players do you think was the most controversial to put into this list but i'm going to start with lundstrom and i'd say he's a bit risky and i'd say if i ask most fpl managers who has their favorite player been this season if you own john lundstrom especially from the start he is probably your number one choice but from game weeks 24 to 27 towards the end of the season he did pretty much get dropped for Sander Berg, who came in in the January transfer window. Uh, and Lundstrom played for a few games after that, I think, and then he started missing out. But the thing that's kind of enticing and, and maybe a good reason to keep him is in game week 29, he did play. They played Norwich at home. He got an assist. He got bonus points. And he came away with 12 points in that week. So I wouldn't get me wrong. If we get some news, like maybe the manager starts talking him up pre-season, says that he's, you know, he was overdue arrest and stuff like that, and you know he's going to be in their plans, then maybe it's worth keeping him. Um, he had played a lot of minutes this season. If you look back at the season before when they were in the championship, he barely played at all. And obviously, Premier League as well takes its toll on players. So to come from not playing very much to playing week in, week out, maybe he just needed a rest. Maybe he just wasn't used to it. It's hard to say. But on the flip side... Do you need a four-game period of rest when a new player has come in in January? Is that just a coincidence? Did he need a rest or did they just think that Sander Berg um, was a better option? Now, if you've got him for four million as an enabler and he's still in your team, I don't really see a huge amount uh, wrong with keeping him. Obviously, that depends on how many players you want in the double game week in the opening, uh, what we think is going to be game week 39. Because Sheffield United do have a double game week and a lot of people will go for maybe one or two defenders, potentially even an attacker as well as an enabler like Fleck or McBurney. And if you start doing that and you want to get absolutely nailed on players, then John Lundstrom potentially is not the one if he's lost his place. Now, obviously, on the flip side again, if he keeps his place, then he's a great option, even at 4.9 million, given the fact that he's listed as a defender playing in midfield, uh, then even I would want him in my team. But I think, given what we know, that he seemed to have lost his place, although he did play in that final game, which is why it's hard to completely rule him out, he is one I would look at avoiding, but as you all know, I've avoided him for a lot of the season. I've absolutely regretted it. So I think this is one of those, if he's in your team, you're not free hitting, you probably keep him. Uh, but 39.1% ownership, that feels like a lot for a player that only started one of the last five games. Plenty of competition for his place as well. Um, so I think for now, unless we get any more news, it's an avoid for me. So we've done a defender, albeit a defender that plays in midfield. Now let's do an actual midfielder. James Madison, 7.5 million at Leicester and he's not had an awful season six goals five assists so far which is decent but seven of those 11 returns came between game week eight to 60 and I actually owned him for quite a few and it was a good period for him scoring FPL points outside of that he's not been too consistent and especially if you jumped on while he was scoring those points towards the end like game week 15 16 17 it really was kind of all downhill from then he didn't really do um, too much right for, for FPL managers. Didn't score too many points at all uh, and hasn't really scored many goals or got many assists since. Um, now, to be fair as well, given the amount of chances he creates, I don't think five assists for the whole season is actually that good, especially when you're aiming at someone like um, Jamie Vardy when you've got corners, all set pieces basically for James Madison. He's aiming towards players like Soyuncu, Johnny Evans. I don't think five assists is actually good enough when you consider the amount of chances he's created this season. And Leicester have got pretty tough fixtures remaining. So just... 
without th even thinking about the order the order i've got on the screen is hopefully what it's going to be but even looking at the remaining fixtures they have to play spurs man united everton arsenal watford and sheffield united it is pretty tricky for them now Again, thinking of some positives, I don't want this all to be negative about every single player. I want to try and think of some positives just in case you're owning this player and you want to think about bringing them in or taking them out or whatever it might be. Uh, you'd think all teams pretty much, at least from a physical point of view, will benefit from the break they've had during lockdown. Now, you know, we hear managers like Pep Guardiola talk about rhythm and it's going to take players a lot of time now to get back up to scratch or back up to how good they were before. But physically, the break will do them good. And yeah, every team is going to benefit from that. But you've got to think about certain players. So Jamie Vardy, for example, extremely quick. Pace is one of the huge um, kind of factors to his game. Obviously, he can finish as well. But getting him in behind is a big thing that Leicester try and do. You see Madison get the ball. He always tries to play it in behind to Vardy. And Vardy's not getting any younger. Um, and that pace, at some point, is going to start to diminish. So getting a break this far into the season for him, I think, will be good. So there is a chance that Madison could come back and absolutely fire. But I just think five assists over what we had, like 29 game weeks already, that doesn't seem good enough to me. And if you look at the form that someone like Harvey Barnes was in before the season ended... He's only on seven points less than Madison. Not only that, he's 1.3 million cheaper, so much better value. And he's played around 600 minutes less. If he had played the same amount of minutes as Madison, there's no doubt in my mind Harvey Barnes would be ahead of him. But obviously, the kind of flip side to that, and I can hear some people saying it is, you pay that premium for Madison because you know he's going to start. For everything we know going on what's happened in the season so far, Madison will be in that team week in, week out. But I would like to think that Barnes played so well that Brendan Rodgers will see that and start him in the team. And I think, to be fair, if you look at Leicester's kind of first 11 or best 11, Barnes is part of that, uh, better than Gray, better than Albright. So I do think he'll continue to start, and I do think he's going to provide better value. Personally, I had Barnes in my team, and during lockdown, I took him out because of the fixtures they got remaining. It's, it's an okay opener as long as these are the fixtures they start with, Watford, Brighton, Everton, and Crystal Palace. But overall... They've got some tough players uh, or some tough fixtures. So I'm not really looking at owning any of their players, at least not midfielders. Jamie Vardy may be up for consideration if I can afford to get him in. But James Madison, I would be avoiding if I was going to put a Leicester midfielder in. I think it would be Barnes. And 18.8% ownership for Madison, that feels a bit high for me. So if you didn't think John Lundstrom was controversial, you probably will think Danny Ings is. And I'm going to talk about why I've got him on the list. I'm not trying to be controversial for the sake of it. Obviously, he's been very good to me, very good to a lot of FPL managers this season. Uh, and I know you're probably looking at it. 7.1 million forward, 140 points, 4.8 points per match. 15 goals this season is not far off what Mo Salah has scored. Obviously, he doesn't have the assists to go with it. But he is a lot cheaper as well. But 29.2% ownership. I do think there is some conversation to be had about why he's a potential to avoid. And I own him. So I'm not even saying that um, you shouldn't have even owned him up until this point. I own him and I'm even thinking about potentially getting rid of him. Now, if you look at the fixtures, even the opening ones, again, caveat is as long as they are the opening four fixtures, they're pretty tough. Norwich away, a good fixture. And, you know, whether at home or away is even going to matter, I don't know. But Norwich is a good fixture. So I'm not saying you have to get rid of him straight away. But I do think he wouldn't be the first forward that I would look at if I was looking to bring one in. So it looks like we're going to have nine game weeks to end the season again we're still waiting for fpl to open but there is going to be nine rounds of games so it would make sense that fpl open with nine game weeks especially when they basically said there's going to be a double game week to open and it looks like six of them will be long game weeks so i.e just a normal one saturday to saturday ish it, it, you know it's friday to monday whatever that's when the fixtures will be played the next game week might start on friday as well so friday to friday saturday to saturday whatever there's a week in between the rounds starting uh and and then going again and then there's going to be three shorter weeks at least that's what it kind of sounds like where you know they'll play the last game of one round on like a monday and then the next round will start almost probably the next day on tuesday or wednesday uh, and then we'll go again and we know or at least we saw over christmas that danny Ings couldn't play those games in quick succession now obviously the difference being up until christmas he'd already played a lot of matches now he's had a long break like everyone else so perhaps like i talked about with jamie vardy maybe that will benefit him but the good thing about it is um, Hasenhutl basically came out and said that he was going to be rotated. Now, he didn't always get rotated the next game, but he did get rotated maybe the game after that. So we knew when he said it, it was going to happen. So if he does say anything like that, maybe he talks about Ings going into the start of the season, that would start to worry me because he's not a manager that kind of plays these mind games. If he says it, that's kind of what happens. So aside from that, and don't get me wrong, 15 goals is so good. This is one of Danny Ings' best seasons ever in the Premier League and... 
kind of the season he almost deserved because his injury record has not been the greatest. And obviously, some players, there's just nothing you can do about it. He's probably not doing anything wrong. He's just been unlucky. But Southampton do have really tricky fixtures to end. So out of the remaining nine games weeks they've got, they've got to play Arsenal, Sheffield United, Watford, Man City, Everton, and Man United. And obviously, that Norwich fixture looks good. So if you already own him, perhaps you could keep him for that and then get rid. Um, but... For the remainder of the season, especially if you're looking to bring him in, I would be looking to avoid, I think. I think there's a little bit of worry about whether he'll get rotated. Granted, though, there has been a long break. And I also think there's other options that are good up front. Calvert-Lewin, Jimenez, Jota, Vardy, who we just spoke about. Rashford's also back from injury. So there's plenty of options as well. Uh, and we're going to talk about a Wolves player in a second. And when you see their potential opening four fixtures... I might even make the swap from Danny Ings to Diogo Jota because I just think the fixtures are that good. Now, if he starts every single week... He can do it against the big teams. One of the reasons I bought him in was because he had scored kind of like five goals in seven games. And a lot of those seven games were against these tough teams I'm talking about. So it's not like he can't do it. He has had a break. There's a chance that he'll play through all nine games just because his injury record has been so good. But again, did he need that momentum? Did he need the season to keep going, to keep playing? Will he now get an, you know, an, you know, an injury that's going to affect him or something like that? I just don't know. So I would say out of all the players on the list, this one's the one I'm probably the least sure about. But as an owner, I am definitely thinking about avoiding him already. And if I didn't already own him, I think I would pretty much avoid, to be honest. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So here is that Wolves player I was talking about. And if you look at, again, the potential fixtures, West Ham, Bournemouth, Villa, they are great three opening fixtures. Why I'm looking at maybe doubling up on Jimenez and Jota. But that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is, are there players that we could potentially avoid? And uh, Dharma Traore... Definitely comes under that. 16.9% ownership. So he is quite highly owned. 5.7 midfielder. So quite cheap. And to be fair, I've said this before, but he's one of those players I put down as having a lot of pace and no end product. And it's basically what I fear Daniel James will be like at Man United. So much pace. But unless you can do something when you get towards the goal, it doesn't really matter. And I would say this season, he has proved me wrong. Uh, and he's actually been really good. He's helped Wolves drive forward. He's created chances. He's caused the opposition defences lots and lots of problems. And he's provided some great assists, especially to the likes of Raul Jimenez, crossing that ball in, getting it on his head, ball in the net, bam, one assist to him. In fact, he has seven assists and four goals this season. So in, that's more assists, first of all, than James Madison. And total attacking returns, um, obviously you do prefer midfielders to score goals because you get more points. But overall attack and returns he has 11 which is exactly the same as James Madison so it really has been a good season that value point of view for 5.7 million at times a season he's been really good now the problem is towards the end of the season a bit like John Lundstrom at least the end of the season we've already had you know what I mean he had he looked to have lost his place now he did have a kind of recurring shoulder injury where it kept dislocating which I can't even imagine uh, how frustrating and how painful that is but he did have it kind of pop back into place and it would dislocate again. Uh, and that kind of was reoccurring. And he was playing basically on like a front three. So it was like 3-4-3. Three, three. Um, he was playing in that formation. And then a few times towards the end of the season, they changed it to more of a 3-5-2. So Doherty was really the main attacking threat from the right. And Jota played up front with Jimenez, which is one of the reasons I'm really looking forward or kind of looking to own potentially Diogo Jota. Because if he has that position, especially in a front two, we've seen how good he can be. And it does mean there's a chance that Triori does miss out. So it really depends on the formation. I don't know if we're really going to get much from the managers going into the season about players that may or may not start. It's probably going to be vague at best. I think for 5.7 million, and let's not forget as well, when they changed that formation and Doherty was kind of the main man down the right, he also played really well as well. And I doubt that Nuno has not seen that. So it's a tricky one with Triori. I think for 5.7 million, he's too expensive where i'd want to risk playing him knowing that he might not start every single week if i already owned him would i give him a chance maybe because the fixtures are so good but i'd still probably be looking to get rid of him and again he is a player that i have got rid of over this lockdown period because i just can't be sure and i think walls fixtures are so good i'm probably going to want him and as a defender and maybe even jota like i've said uh, so Trio just doesn't fit in and at 5.7 million i feel like he's too expensive to have on your bench there's a lot of talk about you know, getting a more expensive bench because minutes are going to be managed. But that doesn't mean that those players aren't going to get onto the pitch. If you've got a heavy hitter and his minutes are managed, either they'll start and play less minutes or they'll come on towards the end anyway. So I just think 5.7 million for me is too expensive to play when you don't know if he's going to start. It's too expensive to have on the bench anyway. And he might not start for Wolves even if he does come on. 
So too much money for me. I think this one's an avoid and I have got rid of him. So I am avoiding him. So last on the list is a goalkeeper, David De Gea, 5.3 million, still owned by 11.4% of all managers. And I kind of appreciate that Maybe the really engaged managers that have played throughout the whole season probably don't own him at this point, but I'm sure a few have held on to him throughout all of this, trying to get those Man United clean sheets, which haven't really come. Uh, and potentially we've got some players that are going to return to the game that haven't played for a while that maybe still have him in his team. So I think 11.4%, I definitely would be looking to avoid. And I don't like saying that about Man United players, but if you've watched my videos, you know I don't like or I don't particularly like expensive goalkeepers. Now, I do think, again, talking about a conversation to be had, there's only nine game weeks left. Um, I think cheap goalkeepers are very good because over a good period of time, they do get you good points. They'll get clean sheets when you don't expect it, plenty of saves and stuff like that. But we've only got nine game weeks left now. So I do think there's an argument to be had that a premium keeper that you can maybe rely on for clean sheets could be a good option. And Man United's fixtures are pretty good. Now, we don't know how many clean sheets we're going to get without crowds. Will strikers be more on it than defenders and stuff like that? We just don't really know. But I still think a premium goalkeeper like David De Gea just is not worth it. Um, now, the fixtures are really good. You can see on screen the opening kind of four fixtures are pretty decent. They've got Southampton, Villa, Bournemouth, Brighton, West Ham still to play. And in fact, Spurs, um, hopefully what will be the opening... Um, game week of the season is the only traditional top six side that they have to play and I'm not you know I'm not against owning Man United players I already have Maguire Martial and Bruno Fernandes in my team so because of the fixtures and stuff I am targeting Man United and I do think they're good value uh, but by getting the defender you got I think you've got a bit of an extra chance of getting points so Wan-Bissaka maybe assist potential um, bonus Maguire bonus and goals uh, and we've seen there is there was an article I think I saw on Twitter about the fact that Wan-Bissaka over this lockdown period has tried to improve his creativity his attack and threat and stuff like that now how much he could realistically have done especially when they didn't train for ages I don't know but it's obviously something that he's looking at doing so I think I'd rather take the punt for the same price on the defenders now the eagle-eyed viewers who've looked at Man United defensive options will see that Wan-Bissaka Maguire and De Gea are all the same price and actually so far De Gea has scored the most points but when you look at goalkeepers eight goalkeepers have outscored David De Gea and apart from Henderson who's the same price they are all cheaper so for me it's an easy decision you put that money um, elsewhere you get a cheaper goalkeeper in who's got good fixtures as well and can get save points and if you really want a Man United defender I would probably get one of the outfield ones just hope that Maguire can get a goal or two or, or wan can get an assist or two and they keep up the clean sheets as well and kind of increase I think they're on eight so far kind of increase that going into the rest of the season with good fixtures and I think the outfield uh, are definitely the ones for me so David De Gea definite avoid so that is it for this video hopefully you enjoyed watching if you did or you found it useful make sure to give it a like let me know in the comments below whether you agree disagree are there any other players that you think have got kind of high ownership that we should be avoiding if you are new to this channel there's so much more content to come this week or on next week going into kind of when the season restarts so you'll probably get sick of me to be honest but hit that subscribe button hit that notification bell and there'll be a screen coming up in a minute where you can do that and you can watch another video um, if you want to watch more of my content otherwise i will see you very soon for more videos as soon as fpl is out there'll be tons more to come obviously looking forward to the rest of the season thanks very much like comment share subscribe all that good stuff and i'll see you soon cheers all